Good morning. And welcome to our Uncommon Church community. When you worship with First Parish, there are three things we hope for you. We hope you experience God, we hope you get to know your neighbor a little better, and we hope that when our time is through, you are inspired to live love. For announcements, please refer to your bulletin and look there for your, the Easter schedule of events. After service, we invite you to join us in the fellowship hall for coffee or tea. When we gather for worship, we remember the importance of bringing peace, hope, and love to each other by greeting each other with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. I now invite you to take a deep breath and center yourself and let us be the church at worship. Hosanna, First Parish Yarmouth. Hosanna. Oh, do it again. Hosanna. Hosanna. Very good. That was an improvement. Uh, my name is Diane Benny Camper. I'm your bridge pastor. I'm here till the end of May, and I'm happy to be with you to worship on this special day. Please join me in the call to worship. Cheering crowds sang their praises as Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem to fulfill the ancient prophecy. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. With palms and branches and with their clothes cast on the road to make a pathway, the people sang their joyous acclamation. Ride on, Jesus. Ride through the crowds. Ride on to anguish. Ride on to betrayal. Ride on to the cross. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.
I have too many things to do today, too many accoutrements. Good morning, everybody. So today is a joyous day of Palm Sunday. And if there's any people under the age of 18 or who feel like they're under the age of 18, you can feel free to come up here with your palms and join us. But you don't have to. But you can, because we're going to march around a little bit. Maybe as we go around, you can join us. All right, so Cora's going to be in charge because we start with a donkey, right? And the donkey is in all the stories. I've never quite understood exactly why the donkey is like center in all these stories, right? Every gospel talks about Palm Sunday. They all talk about a donkey. But I think part of it is for, that Jesus knew how Jesus was going to help us, and it wasn't the way we thought. So Jesus was always trying to let us know that. All right, so you guys are going to march around while I keep talking. How's that sound? Can you lead the part where aid? Thank you. And anyone who wants to join in while they march past, you feel free. All right, Cora, go for it. Thank you. So one of the things that's true is that people had been waiting a long time. They had been waiting and waiting and waiting. And suddenly, they heard all this rumor that the person they were waiting for had arrived. And he was coming to Jerusalem. And so when, as he got closer, people got more and more excited. And I'd love for all of you to think about a time when you had been waiting for something and got really excited about it. And were waiting and waiting and waiting. And then it didn't turn out the way you were expecting it to. That's sort of the place that the people in Jerusalem were going to be in. They didn't know it at the time, right? They were still at the point of, yay, the thing we were hoping for happened. And even though it's going to happen, they have to go through not a great time in between. So today, we really want to celebrate the joy of Jesus arriving and, and getting there and everyone knowing that that's who Jesus, that Jesus was the Son of God, that God had come back as they expected, but not in the way they expected. And we'll leave you with that wonder. All right, thank you, parade.
up here. Michelle and, and Greg, as you know, are, are leaving for Turkey soon, and they're masking in order to uh, remain healthy. They want to be healthy when they go, and I promised them that since I don't have a mask on, that as I do every Sunday morning, I tested for COVID, and I'm good. <laughs> um, International Medical Relief is a non-governmental organization based in Colorado that provides health care to vulnerable and underserved populations by recruiting healthcare professionals and other volunteers. International Medical Relief provides disaster response, both domestically and internationally. It was founded in 2002 by Shauna Volmer King in the belief that healthcare should not be the prerogative of select nations and regions or classes. It should be given to all who need it. While not affiliated with any religious entity, this belief is very consistent with the words of the Apostle Paul. At all times, make it your aim to do good to one another and to all people. International Medical Relief has conducted disaster response in over 19 countries. On February 6th, we all remember that a terrible earthquake, 7.8, struck Turkey. Widespread damage in an area about the size of Germany and an estimated 14 million people, or 16% of the population, was affected. Development experts from the United Nations estimate that about a million and a half people were left homeless. There is, of course, continuing need to address the problems and the issues that arose from this earthquake. As members and friends of the First Parish Church in Yarmouth, we're pleased and grateful for the opportunity to commission you Michelle and Greg, as you travel on our behalf, I always like to think about it. When other people go someplace, I like it to be on our behalf. And if we are supporting you, it is on our behalf. So we appreciate the fact that you are going to share your life and your efforts with other children of God living in Turkey. We've collected a myriad of supplies. There's a basket back there. Some have already been packed away. There will be more. Um, there's also a special offering plate over here. If you wish to contribute some money to this effort, you can do that. And if you didn't bring any with you today, you can drop by the uh, office by the 5th of April and make a contribution. Importantly, we thank you for letting us participate in this way. And most importantly, we assure you that you will be in our hearts and our minds and prayers during your time in Turkey and we hope that when you return, you will share your experience with us. Receive this blessing. Let us pray. Almighty God, who out of your love inspire people to be a light to the world, we thank you for those in all ages who have given of themselves to tend it, to care for it, and to serve in every way to forward its wholeness. Now we thank you especially for Michelle and Greg, whom we commission in your name, for the ministry to which you have called them in Turkey. Bless in every way the efforts of Michelle and Greg as they reach out to make a difference in the lives of the people in Turkey. We pray that there may be spiritual gifts discovered within them. Help our friends to truly comprehend that they cannot touch the life of another without being changed themselves. Guide, inspire, and empower Michelle and Greg and in the appointed time, bring them back safely to us, that we may rejoice together that this mission has brought closer the fulfillment you intend for all people. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And now you may go, and we're letting them go so that we don't make them sick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Blessings. Good morning. My name is Seth Weber, and I've got the scripture reading this morning. I'm going to try to spare you my singing, but when I was thinking this morning, I was thinking about that Jesus Christ superstar and Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Right. So today is a day of celebration, of great promise, of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. What could possibly go wrong? Come on Thursday to hear that story. 
And it makes you wonder, must things always seem darkest before the dawn? And there's this great story for Palm Sunday about even the rocks would sing out. And it talks about, it evokes that it's this prophecy from Isaiah. So this morning, let's hear the words from Isaiah chapter 35 as translated in the message. The voiceless break into song. Wilderness and desert will sing joyously. The badlands will celebrate and flower like the crocus in spring bursting into blossom, a symphony of song and color, mountain glories of Lebanon, a gift, awesome Carmel, stunning Sharon, gifts, God's resplendent glory fully on display, God awesome, God majestic. Energize the limp hands, strengthen the rubbery knees, tell fearful souls, courage, take heart, God is here, right here, and his way to put things right, on his way to put things right and redress, redress all wrongs. He's on his way, he'll save you. Blind eyes will be opened, deaf ears unstopped. Lame men and women will leap like deer, the voiceless break into song. Springs of water will burst out in the wilderness, streams flow in the desert, Hut sands will become cool oasis, thirsty grounds, a splashing fountain. Even the lowly jackals will have water to drink and barren grasslands will flourish richly. There will be a highway called the Holy Road. No one rude or rebellious is permitted on this road. It is for God's people exclusively. Impossible to get lost on this road. Not even fools can get lost on it. No lions on this road, no dangerous wild animals, nothing and no one dangerous or threatening. Only the redeemed will walk on it. The people God has ransomed will come back to this road. They'll sing as they make their way home to Zion, unfading halos of joys encircling their heads, welcomed home with gifts of joy and gladness as all sorrows and sighs scurry into the night. The sun serene. Thank you. It is true that we have what some might call high holy days in our church tradition, most notably Christmas and Easter which present a particular problem for the preacher because it is, for the most part, the same story every year. There might be slight variations in the various gospel accounts that allow for coming at the stories from a different direction with a slightly different emphasis. And this is actually why I like Palm Sunday. Sure, every year we hear its powerful message that try though we might, we have not yet yet try though we might, we have not yet domesticated Palm Sunday quite as fully as we have Christmas and Easter. Christmas, while bearing the incredible story of the incarnation of, of God coming to us in human form, we have sentimentalized and prettied up, barely touching on the harsh reality of the day, a holy family in a stable, a holy family fleeing for their lives to a strange country in order to survive the slaughter of all male children born under the age of two in and around Bethlehem. And then there's Easter. How quickly we rush there from today. Too many people gliding all too easily over the reality of betrayal and desertion and death that take place in the events of the intervening days. We have chocolates. We have bunnies designed to take away the pain. Palm Sunday is different. On Palm Sunday, we're confronted with the question of whether or not we're going to get up on that donkey or, or colt and accept the challenging ride along the whole way with Jesus, or do we want instead to get off at a less risky stop? It's a tough question which led me to choose the reading from the Hebrew scriptures today as an approach to Palm Sunday. Isaiah 35 is really a poem, one that involves dramatic transformation. 
It announces the transformation of the earth, of human disabilities, locations, emotions, and destinies. It sings of liberations, jubilant homecomings, and the end of all sorrow and sighing. It replaces deserts with acres of bright blossoms, streams, pools, marshes. It reports leaping and singing and rejoicing, gladness and everlasting joy. The way much of the world looks today, that would be a transformation of historic proportions. Despite the longing of Isaiah's people, these changes did not come to pass. How can these imagined hopes for long ago Israel, and I should say present day Israel too, possibly be meaningful for the present time? Now as then, there are political, spiritual, economic, physical and emotional forms of turmoil and bondage to which any one of us might be subject. Not to mention the warring violence and slaughter in Ukraine and the seeming never-ending threat of gun violence in our own land, even in places full of children. These, so often beyond our individual abilities to change, but with regard to the more personal and individual challenges that we know, the text tells us that there is a way out. Indeed, there is a highway, and it shall be called the Holy Way. Imagine the possibility that the road to Jerusalem that Jesus is on during Holy Week gives us a clue to finding our way as we enter the final stage of our Lenten journey this year. As you heard in the call to worship, the Palm Sunday story begins with Jesus approaching the villages of Bethany and Bethphage, a few miles from Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives stands between these villages and the city. And before going over the hill where they could actually see Jerusalem, Jesus sent two disciples into a nearby village to borrow a donkey. Actually, a pair of donkeys if you're reading Matthew. And at this point, Matthew adds an editorial comment to explain Jesus' actions. He cites a prophecy from Zechariah, which refers to a great king who will arrive in Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion, the prophet exclaims. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The prophet looked forward to a day when a new Israel would be established, an Israel ruled by a king of peace. And Jesus has carefully chosen to identify himself with that prophecy by riding a donkey's colt, just as Zechariah had foreseen. Jesus is declaring his kingship. He is revealing his true identity as the promised Messiah. But he is also declaring that he is not the military hero that many people were expecting. That surely would have brought one kind of trouble the sort of trouble we see too much of in our newscasts these days. He declares instead that the true Messiah is the king of peace, that Zechariah foretold the one who comes in weakness and humility, not in power and might. He shows that his means are nonviolent. Yes, he intends to change the political order, but he will do it by disarming, not by arming for battle and that is bound to create its own kind of trouble. <clears throat> the statement that Jesus makes becomes even more striking when we realize that at perhaps the very same time that Jesus is mounting his nonviolent demonstration, as he enters the city of Jerusalem from the east, there is a Roman military garrison arriving from the west. Now Passover, which was about to begin, always brought huge crowds to Jerusalem. So to maintain order, the Romans sent reinforcements to the city of Jerusalem for the festival. We can imagine them arriving in full military regalia and with great fanfare on the other edge of town, just as Jesus makes his way down the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley and into the walled city of Jerusalem. Jesus showed extraordinary love and courage on Palm Sunday. 
And when he confronted his foes and was ready to see the results through to their awful end, he was determined. Against the powerful pull of his own anxieties and fears, against the temptation to turn around and and take a different way, Jesus mounted the donkey and headed down the winding road to Jerusalem, surrounded by disciples, not one of whom really understood him, and hemmed in by a crowd that cheered him for all the wrong reasons. On he rode astride that little donkey as a prince of peace entering the holy city. Ever since, his followers have celebrated this day with both joy and sadness. We are full of energy and anticipation, waving palms, when today's time of worship begins. And yet, if we pause for a moment, surely we know what events come during the pending week, the Via Della Rosa, the sorrowful way that Jesus walked on the way to his crucifixion. Anyone who goes from today to next Sunday without remembering the route in between celebrates a hollow Easter indeed. Nevertheless, Palm Sunday holds a special fascination. Why? Maybe because for once Jesus was being cheered as he deserved to be cheered. Maybe because of the sheer beauty of the love and courage which he displayed that love and courage which are the true hope of this weary old world. What kind of courage is this? Well, it's, it's not the impulsive recklessness of those who don't recognize danger. It's not the bravery of those who seem born without the capacity for deep fear. It's not a show of bravado in order to try to bluff the opposition. It's not human vanity looking for its moment of glory. The courage of Jesus is something quite different. It is special. It was displayed in spite of anxiety and fear about the future. Jesus' courage was unique in its purity. It is the courage born of faith, hope, and love. But above all, it is born of love, of sacrificial love. As we gather today as one body, but not all in one place, separated by physical distance, but still woven together in the power of the Spirit, here in the midst of the Palm Sunday story, with whom do we identify? Do we feel a kinship with the common folk who are shouting Hosanna, celebrating because the one who has worked among them, ministering to their needs, is now challenging the controlling political structure? Or do we feel more sympathy with the people of Jerusalem, the powerful elite, who suspiciously asks, who is this man who is creating such turmoil in the city? Who is this that threatens to disrupt the relative peace we have worked so hard to achieve and question, maybe even destroy the way we have capitulated with Caesar? As we know, the events of the coming week show us how short a trip it is from asking who is this Jesus today to crying crucify him by Friday. Which brings us to one of the basic and challenging questions of our faith. Why did Jesus die? Well, he died for many reasons. He died because he exposed the powers He died because he confronted the injustices. He died because he would not allow himself to be controlled by the expectations of his family, by the opinions of the public, by the norms of his culture. Jesus died because he would not allow himself to be controlled by the most intimidating, brutal symbol that the then most powerful nation in the world had produced the cross designed by Rome to keep a nation in its place by publicly executing hundreds of people at one time. Jesus died because he would not allow himself to be controlled by the fear of dying. Instead, Jesus persevered in his belief 
that we live for one another, and the principle of love is worth dying for. Indeed, he undercut the power of the cross to intimidate people by inviting his disciples to embrace it. Take up your cross and follow me, he said. Don't be afraid. Or maybe do be afraid, but don't let your fear diminish you. Don't let your fear define you. Don't let your fear keep you from wholeheartedly, unabashedly pursuing the ways that give life to the world. Some years ago, I read a book called Four Spirits. It was written by the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. It's a name that I remember from the civil rights days. And he's lying in a Birmingham hospital telling this story after being injured by one of Bull Connor's fire hoses during a series of civil rights demonstrations, which resulted in the incarceration of hundreds of black children. And a little seven-year-old boy named Edmund comes to see Shuttlesworth. And the minister prays with him. This is in jail, mind you. And as they opened their eyes, Edmund says, I didn't let them put me in jail. I just ran off. Did you? The minister wrinkled his forehead. He stared hard, but lovingly. Then I got to tell you, Edmund, don't be afraid of the jail. They can't jail a soul. Your spirit, it remains free, even if your body's behind bars. Yes, sir, next time you go on to jail like a good boy. Jesus died because he knew that not only can they not jail a soul, they can't kill one either, that there's something way more important than just living. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, he said at another time, but those who lose their life will keep it. History is replete with stories of common folk who have recognized that we are able to accomplish so much more when we work together than ever alone. Stories we do well to remember in this last step of Lent. Think of the women and men who provided safe passage on the Underground Railroad. Remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others in the German Confessing Church in the 1930s who took a definitive stance that their loyalty was to Jesus as Lord not to Hitler and the Nazis. Last Sunday, we remembered Bloody Sunday, that march from Selma to Montgomery, an unfinished march for racial freedom in our country, marches that continue to this day because black lives do matter. On Palm Sunday, let us remember these stories and so many others, so many marches, where we find the courage to march with Jesus who showed us the way and proclaim a word of peace and reconciliation. Now there are marches we should not follow, and it certainly disturbed me to see a demonstration of neo-Nazis walking in the streets of Portland yesterday. That's not one you want to follow. Jesus' parade was headed in the way of inclusion and acceptance, but his enemies preferred the direction of exclusion and so-called purity. Jesus was marching in the way of mercy and forgiveness, yet some of his opponents were intent on pursuing vengeance and retribution. Jesus was parading toward the goal of humility and service, but those who plotted against him were more concerned with status and privilege. Of Jesus, the 19th century Scots congregational minister and poet George MacDonald wrote, Jesus did not come to meet our expectations of what a king should be like. He came to meet our need, to bring us peace we could not have on our own. He came to meet our deepest needs, our need for a means to God that is not self-devised, our need for salvation that is more than a political solution our need for the truth about who God really is, rather than who we hoped God would be. So look out there on Main Street. From the east, Jesus and his followers, his humble followers are coming, and from the west, the Roman garrison coming out of Cumberland. (laughs) 
Where does our Holy Week take us? The road is open ahead of us. It is quite possible that the road we select will lead to some place like Jerusalem. It is a challenging decision. You've got to watch where you're going. We all do. And while you're at it, remember that Jesus chose a donkey to carry him to Jerusalem. So without making too obvious a parallel, let me ask, if Jesus chose a donkey then, how much less likely am I or you as a means of carrying him now? Yet Jesus has chosen me, and he has chosen you as well. An unlikely means of transport, but we are chosen, and we must carry him as best we can down all the roads that come before us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who, through death, invites us to life. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, as when he comes into our lives as the presence of God, it is a time of rejoicing. Faith in him gives us strength to face the challenges and temptations of life. He touches our sufferings with his own suffering on the cross. He makes our struggles for justice worthwhile. He enables us to hope for peace in this world and for eternal life in the world to come. Jesus enters, and our spirits are revived by his spirit. Everyone here is invited to participate in this memorial meal. 
Join me now, if you will, in the communion litany. How we love a parade, O God. The beat of the drum, the thrill of the music. Let us march with you, O God. We want to join your parade. Like elephants and kangaroos, graceful giraffes and pleased people, we disembark from Noah's Ark and behold your rainbow promise. We want to join your parade, O God. To the beat of Miriam's tambourine, we dance across the Red Sea, stepping away from slavery, flying toward freedom. We want to join your parade, O God, with songs and cymbals, castanets and clapping, with all the believers filled with joy, David danced the scriptures back to Jerusalem. We want to join your parade, O God, with waving palms and chanting psalms, our Jesus comes to Jerusalem. We want to join your parade, O God. All creation joins the parade. The very stones cry out in delight. As we take this holy food, we take courage, the courage to join this holy parade, the courage to sing Hosanna, even in the face of evil, the courage to face death and to face life. And so we do what Jesus did. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion and on the eve of death, Jesus gathered with the disciples at the feast of Passover. Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. In the same way also the cup after supper saying, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the redemption of sin. Consecrate, therefore, by your Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, and bless us that as we receive them at this table, we may offer you our faith and praise. We may be united with Christ and with one another, and we may continue faithful in all things. Let us pray as Christ our Savior has taught us using whatever form you prefer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come for all things are ready. And this is gluten-free bread, I am told.
Let us give thanks. Oh Jesus, we have held you in our hands. We give you thanks for having touched your grace and having felt your love. May we carry that love on all we say, in all we do, in all we are. Amen. of welcome, a joyful procession, a community celebrating together. The same vision is offered to us today. Welcome Christ into your lives. Celebrate his transforming power. Make peace from the practice of justice, equality from the practice of respect. As this week unfolds, be overtaken by God's love and pour it back into the world. Amen.